Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's Carbon Connected webinar. This one, um, we're going to be talking about sustainable food and what that means for um, what 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 that means for achieving a low carbon diet. Uh, we're lucky to have with us three speakers. We're going to have here from uh, Ava Dunkley and Luke Harris um, from the Warwick University Veg Society, um, and they'll be talking about um, uh, plant-based diets and about the uh, the relationship between uh, plant-based based diets and, and and carbon emissions and climate change. And we're also going to be hearing from um, George Bostock from the National Farmers Union, who's going to be talking about local food production. And I think um, that's going to be a really um, interesting way of us thinking about um, sustainable food and what what our food means for climate change, because there's obviously different uh, different ways that we can think about this and some very different perspectives. And some of it is about what we choose to eat um, and, and, and the impacts that that can have. But the other is about where that food is grown. And, you know, clearly, you know, whether it's grown um, thousands of miles away or locally is also a really important and relevant factor in this. So I think having the, the, the two perspectives um, on that will hopefully give us a really interesting, um, uh, uh, some, some in fact really interesting points of view. I think it's worth emphasising this is a, a really complex area um, and you know I know our speakers are going to um, try and keep their, um, their, their, their views uh, as informative as possible and stick to um, as far as possible to the sort of uh, facts around this um, because I think for the rest of us it's really quite hard to untangle what the right thing to do on these things is sometimes. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really grateful for the speakers giving their time to help us think those things through. I think it's also finally, before I hand over to the speakers, we're saying that um, food production, the relationship between food production and climate change is, is, a, is a two way one, really. Um, clearly, um, food production and the distribution of food impacts on our climate and uh, we'll be we'll be hearing plenty about that i'm sure but i think it's also important to keep in our minds that our climate impacts on our ability for food production as well um, and we, we we are sort of seeing changes in our climate already we'll see more changes in our climate um, and uh, bearing that in mind as well is going to be a, a an interesting an interesting point so um what we'll do is um after the two presentations, uh, I may ask a few questions, but I'll do a do, do a short roundup. But um, really, without any sort of further ado, I'll hand over to Ava and and Luke to um, talk about um, the, the 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 Veg Society's view on um, a low carbon diet. Hi, oh, yeah. um, so yeah, we're going to give a quick presentation on transitioning to a vegan lifestyle. Um, so first up, uh, these are the topics we're just going to quickly run through. Um, so kind of what does vegan mean? Why do people go vegan? Um, and then some easy changes for people to make if they're interested in making the journey. Um, so yeah, over to Luke. Yeah, so we are Warwick Vegan and Vegetarian Society. I'm the president, Ava's the vice president. We uh, we really focus on trying to create like a good community sort of space for people because community is a really important part of food and like we always eat together, we cook together, we go out to eat together. Um, so we want to make people sure that even when you're a vegan or vegetarian, you can still have a nice like sense of community. So we do that by running social events like pub evenings, coffee mornings, just hanging out with people, but also bi-weekly uh, cooking lessons to teach students how to cook sort of affordable, healthy, environmentally friendly meals, because students just typically do not know how to cook. So it's really important that we, we that's our main focus, really. Um, so yeah, what does vegan mean? So we've taken this definition from the Vegan Society, um, and I think it's a really good one because it highlights that being vegan is about practicality and possibility. Um, it's not about being perfect. Um, it's just about doing like small changes that you can easily make in your life um, to make a positive difference. Um, so, yeah, why do people go vegan? 
Um, yeah, so we're just going to go over sort of the three main reasons people tend to go vegan, being the planet, people's health, and the animals themselves. Um, okay, so as we know, we need to keep the global temperature rise to a minimum. A maximum of 1.5 degrees is advised by scientists to avoid the worst climate change impacts, but we are on, already on track to far like exceed this by 2100. Um, so how, where do animals come into this? Well, animal agriculture activities account for 18% of total greenhouse gas emissions, which is the second highest after all transport combined. So there's a huge amount of, uh, of emissions. Um, so 26% of the world's surface is used for grazing animals. Meat and dairy take up 83% of global agricultural land, but only supply 18% of global calories. It's hugely inefficient. So moving towards a vegan lifestyle really helps with the amount of land we actually have to use. The biggest Oxford study, the biggest study ever done on the relationship between agriculture and uh, the environment was done by Oxford University researchers in 2019. And it found that we could feed every mouth on the planet if we all went vegan while cutting down the, uh, the amount of land we use by 75%. So it's a huge amount of land we could just stop having to use, which would stop what I've got here is animal agriculture is the single largest driver of habitat destruction, which is like deforestation, biodiversity loss, species extinction. So it all hugely be cut down by a transition to a vegan diet. Um, the amount of water used by animal agriculture is also just colossal. Uh, one single beef burger uses the same amount of water as showering for two months. So if you're concerned about water use, please cut down on animal agriculture. And then something we're not going to focus on today, but it's also really important, is zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. Basically, animal agriculture it has been the cause of every pandemic that we have in re recent history. SARS, MERS, the Spanish flu in 1918, uh, avian flu, all influenzas come from animal agriculture. We, we really, if we want to cut down our risk of pandemics, moving to a vegan lifestyle is great for that as well. Um, so yeah, a large um, population of people uh, reduce their dairy and meat intake for health reasons. Um, the NHS has stated that a fully vegan diet can be healthy and provide all the nutrients a human body needs. Um, it has been shown that a vegan diet can reduce um, high cholesterol, heart disease and type 2 diabetes. If you're interested in looking into this, the um, references at the end of our slides um, provide more information and also the documentaries Game Changers and What the Health um, are both really factual and good for making the transition to a vegan diet. Um, so one of the most common pe uh, questions people have about going vegan is where to get protein from. Um, it's actually really easy to do on this diet and people probably already consume plant-based protein without even realizing. Um, so I've just listed a few of the, um, the main protein rich vegan foods um, and then other sources um, like quinoa and buckwheat are complete proteins and have all the essential amino acids our body needs. Um, also for those interested in like more protein, um, a lot of retailers now provide like vegan protein powders, bars and supplements, um, which are really accessible. Um, so yeah, the other reason that people tend to go vegan is for like ethical reasons. More than 70 billion, and that's land animals alone, are killed annually just for food. And it goes up into the trillions, but it's really hard to keep count if you add uh, fish and aquatic animals, because there's just no way to track the amount killed. Um, so yeah, if you are against sort of animal cruelty, then that's the main reason people move towards a vegan lifestyle. It's just why, why, why cause unnecessary suffering, basically. Um, so yeah, I've been vegan for nearly seven years now and I thought it'd be great to make a like, quick list of kind of tips if people want to make this journey. Um, I think it's really important to know kind of what ingredients to look out for on packaging. So um, like milk and eggs and whey are, tend to be in bold, so they're kind of easy to spot. Um, but other ones like casein, um, gelatin, honey, beeswax, um, people tend to miss. So it's just a good place to start. Um, Obviously, it's recommended that people who are vegan or vegetarian take a B12 supplement. I think this is really important. Um, you can still have a really healthy diet on a vegan diet, but the um, B12 gets washed off of vegetables. So it's important to take a supplement. 
um i think it's never really been easier to be vegan in this kind of climate um so knowing like where to get food from like restaurants and not feel like you're missing out is an important part of this lifestyle um and yeah also just to remember why you went vegan in the first place i think is really important and also if you mess up or like accidentally have something non-vegan that it's not the end of the world you can just start again or just like remember that not everyone's perfect uh, so here's just a few of the foods you might have already without realizing that they're vegan huge amounts of food that you can you can just have oreos loads of crisps crumpets and stuff um, there's so many alternatives that you can you can have that you don't need to use animal products with um, so yeah, I've included some recipe um, websites if you're interested. Um, people don't really know where to start. This is a great place. Um, and just the foods that we eat on like a day-to-day -day basis, you can really easily veganize by like swapping out animal-based like mints or sausages and replacing them either with the um, meat alternatives found in supermarkets or even just sticking to like vegetable um, options like lentils, black beans, kidney beans um, work really well in chilies and curries. Uh, it's also important to note that a vegan lifestyle isn't just about what you eat. What you eat is the biggest part of it, but it's also like clothes, like leather and stuff like that. So it's important to just keep an eye out for sort of symbols like these, um, like vegan approved sort of style symbols that can just let you know that there wasn't cruel practices used in the, in the production of the products. Um, there are so many resources for those um, interested. So we're just going to list a few of the um, of our favorite like podcasts and books. Um, so these podcasts are really interesting if you're on the go and just want to like find out more information, especially the Disclosure podcast by Ed Winters, I would highly recommend. Yeah, so here's some great books if you want to have some proper like information. Uh, again, by Ed Winters, this is Vegan Propaganda. It's a really comprehensive guide to all things related to veganism and ag animal agriculture. How Not to Die is more about uh, the nutritional aspect and then Animal Liberation is more about the like the ethics behind it. Um, yeah, for documentaries, there's um, a lot on Netflix at the moment. Um, Game Changers, I would highly recommend about athletes and sport and how a vegan lifestyle can be really healthy. Um, and then the environmental side, Cowspiracy, and the recently um, released Seaspiracy kind of opens up um, to what goes on in those practices and um, some of the damaging um, impacts of animal agriculture. Uh, so yeah, here's some YouTube channels, like if you just want quick, easy access information, there's so much online now. Again, Earthling Ed, that's Ed Winters from the podcast and the book we were talking about. He's really great for just quick bursts of information about why people go vegan. But then Avant Garde Vegan is more about recipes. Mike the Vegan is more about uh, sort of, well, a few different arguments to do with veganism. It's, it's, it's all good content. There's so much available. Uh, so yeah, thank you for watching our presentation. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out by email or here's our Instagram and Facebook page. And um, here's our list of references if you did have anything you wanted to follow up on. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks. Hey, well, Luke, thank you so much for that. That's uh, that's really interesting. Mike, come back to uh, just uh, for one or two points of clarification um, at, at the end, but. Uh, I think before we do that, we'll, um, we'll we'll move on to George. So George Fostock from the NFU, um, over to you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, I will just quickly get my presentation ready to go. Ten seconds. Um, so I've been asked to prepare about 50 minutes or so. Oh, I think I'm showing the one slide there. Can you see? Yes, we can see, see your emails at the moment, George. Yeah. Sorry, it's uh, getting a bit over eager. Windows. Can you see that? Yes. Perfect. So, yes, 50 minutes or so. So, I was asked to talk about food sustainability and farming well this year. So, firstly, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this to the district so you can all watch back it watch back. My name is George Bostock and I work as the NFU County Advisor for Wiltshire, um, working with farmers across Wiltshire as well as liaising with stakeholders across the county to understand the importance of British farming. 
So very quickly, obviously, we're talking about food sustainability, but I wanted to start by highlighting the importance of farming across the county and indeed the UK. Um, Warwickshire farms generate more than 138 million for the regional economy. That's uh, 2,000 farm holdings, more than 160,000 hectares of land that's being looked after just in Warwickshire. There's also 48 council owned farms in there covering 2,000 hectares. Now, obviously, yeah, it's just huge for the regional economy and in Warwickshire. Um, there's 510 cereal farms covering 80,000 hectares, producing your wheat, your maize, your rape, your barley, your oats. And there's also major businesses, including dairy, livestock and poultry across Wiltshire. Now, why is this important to sustainability? So you cannot get more sustainable than buying local and buying British. Our food does not need to be shipped across the world, having a detrimental impact on the environment where it's grown to lesser standards. UK is the perfect maritime climate to grow crops that we eat, brilliant seasonal fruit and veg. Our climate grows luscious green grass, inedible, inedible to ourselves, but that our livestock eat, producing a fantastic sustainable product full of nutrients that we need for a healthy diet. Across the South Wiltshire and Warwick district, we have great farmers producing fruit and veg, meat and dairy to feed the nation to world leading standards, while also increasing biodiversity and helping the environment. This presentation is really going to focus on why, for food sustainability, British is the way to go. So what is food sustainability? The United Nations defines it as the idea that something, agriculture, fishing or preparation of food, is done in a way that is not wasteful of our natural resource and can be continued into the future without being detrimental to our environment or our health. Now, let's be frank, there are people in society who believe farming and agriculture cannot be environmentally friendly that livestock production is a massive cause of greenhouse gas, is unhealthy, and in turn cannot be sustainable. I'm not here to tell you that eating meat and dairy is right or wrong, but I can put a great argument to showcase that British farm livestock and crops are the most sustainable in the world, and British farmers are part of the solution when it comes to sustainability and offsetting carbon, as well as growing, as growing biodiversity. Most importantly, when out doing a weekly food shop, to be sustainable, you need to be eating balanced and buying British for your own food sustainability. So let's talk about the environment. Um, farming agriculture seems to get a lot of the blame when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. There are a lot of myths out there that a simple solution to solving climate change is often advertised as giving up meat and dairy. Though, as you can see, the UK government released this data back in 2019, highlighting that in total 10% of UK emissions comes from farming. I was actually at the Warwickshire Climate Conference last month at Warwick University, and one of the presenters highlighted that agriculture emissions in Warwickshire was less than 4%, paling into insignificance compared to other industries and transport. Indeed, there is now a growing body of science that showcases that methane from livestock is contributing less to global greenhouse gas emissions than has previously been suggested. One of the scientists leading on this work is a Professor Miles Allen from Oxford University, and there's a number of scientists around the world. Um, I won't go into an abundance of detail, but I recommend you take a look at his work on Google. Essentially, the bottom line is, um, while methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, it is currently treated the same way as you treat carbon dioxide, which lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds or thousands of years, always accumulating. While methane, while being very potent, is also very short-lived, and after 10 years, is fully oxidised into the atmosphere. What this means is, due to the fact in British agriculture, we've got better at maintaining the cattle and being more productive. Um, methane levels are actually dropping in our country, so you could argue that livestock farming in the UK is actually contributing to global cooling due to the fact we are now a lot more sufficient. Indeed, if you go on to my, my next slide, which I believe you can see there, um, greenhouse gas emissions from UK beef are now less than half the global average. Um, and when you look at dairy, um, there are 265 million dairy cows worldwide. Now, if they were all as efficient as UK dairy cows, we would only need 83 million. I think that's vastly important. So when you're doing your weekly food shop, as already said, buy British, because we are doing it to world leading standards, which is benefiting the environment. Moving on to natural resource and going back to my UN definition of food sustainability, it is underpinned by not being wasteful of a natural resource. Although a lot of our countryside in the UK is farmland, roughly 70%, only around 35% of it can actually be used to grow crops like wheat and potatoes, with only around a further half of that being able to grow fruit and vegetables. It's important to realise that 65% of UK agricultural land is grassland and meadow, unable to support food crops but ideal for grazing animals. By using this land to graze livestock, like cattle and sheep, farmers can produce good quality, nutritious food while maintaining the land for nature, providing wildlife with habitats, food sources and shelter. 
the natural resource in this lush green grass is produced by our maritime warm and wet climate. Livestock like this, um, livestock take this inedible product and turn it into nutritious meat and dairy. And let's not forget about the carbon locked up in the ground. In a world in certain times, food security has never been so important and prime agricultural land must remain in place to grow and reduce the food that our nation and nations around the world need to feed people sustainably. And natural resources we have in the UK could not be more perfect for producing this food. So I thought I'd talk very, very briefly on UK farmers going at zero. Now, obviously, as already mentioned, 10% is what we produce in the UK. It's still 10% and we need to do our bit like all industry needs to do across the world. Now, the National Farmers Union has set the ambitious goal of reducing net zero greenhouse gas emissions across the whole of agriculture in England and Wales by 2040. Now, agriculture is part of the solution when done correctly, and we were ahead of the game when we made this commitment in 2019, ahead of many other organisations. Now, agriculture and the land-based economy can play a key role in tackling climate change. It is uniquely placed to capture the major greenhouse gas of carbon dioxide from the air and turn it with the help of farmers into a wide range of foods and fuels. By enhancing this ability to, carbon cap to capture carbon, we can use it to generate negative emissions, actively removing CO2 from the atmosphere and balancing out agricultural emissions. How are farmers doing that? There's three main pillars. We're going to boost productivity to reduce emissions. We're going to have more farmland, which is going to be storing carbon, and we're going to be having more and more energy, um, renewable energy. To illustrate that, you know, in terms of producing more productivity, there's going to be precision fertilizers, there's going to be precision feeding, there's going to be better genetics, there's going to be feed additives, which mean livestock essentially produce less methane. In terms of carbon storage, there's going to be more organic manure use, which will create better soils, which will hold more carbon. There's going to be larger hedgerows, there's going to be more woodland. We're going to maintain grassland. For example, there's 3.2 million hectares of woodland and forest that's one UK farms, all storing carbon, and we're going to grow this. In terms of renewables, we've got solar, we've got wind, we've got AD plants, we've got biomass boilers. Farmers produce enough energy already to power 10 million homes across the UK, and that is growing day by day with more and more farmers diversifying to take up this energy resource, which is vital, especially at the current time. Now, as well, I'm going to look at biodiversity. As well as producing high quality, safe, affordable, climate friendly food, our agricultural, our agricultural sector plays an integral part in protecting, maintaining and enhancing the countryside, providing habitats and food sources that underpin biodiversity across the country. UK farmers across Wiltshire as a county have signed up to schemes to boost biodiversity and wildlife. Farmers are the caretakers of the UK countryside and maintain the green idyllic image we know and love across Wiltshire. Like I said before, there's 3.2 million hectares of woodland on UK farms across the UK. There are 10,000 football pitches of wildflower meadow used to boost biodiversity. We've got 23,000 hectares of food sources for farmland birds. We've got 47,000 hectares of bubble strips, which protect watercourses. And we've got 550,000 kilometres of hedgerows, which are used to, ho to home birds and other wildlife, as well as storing a lot of carbon. When we are talking about food sustainability, it's important the food you're eating is not having a detrimental effect on the environment and farmers day in day out are protecting our countryside and our wildlife. Now, one thing that I'm very passionate about is eating in season. Um, and so you look at this calendar here, which shows you exactly what you can have throughout the year. Now, we focus a lot on livestock so far, though it's important to look at fruit and veg as well. There are a number of good reasons to eat more local seasonal food. To reduce the energy and associated CO2 emissions needed to grow, transport and the food we eat. To avoid paying a premium for food that is scarcer or has travelled a long way. To support the local economy, to reconnect with nature's cycles and the passing of time. But most importantly, seasonal food is fresher and so tends to be tastier and more nutritious. Obviously, working for the NFU, a lot of people think we are against the vegetarian, vegan lifestyle, but this is simply not the case. Personally, I would support a balanced diet of fruit, veg and meat. They would never argue against someone's choice of diet. I represent a number of farmers and a significant number of producing crops and vegetables all year round, and naturally a vegan vegetarian will be eating this produce. Naturally, the most sustainable method of acquiring food is to source locally. By this, I mean in the local area, if possible, the host of farm shops and markets on offer, especially in Wiltshire, but most importantly, by purchasing British and not purchasing from abroad. On the meat front, standards in the UK are by far some of the best in the world, for sustainable. Um, and buying fruit and veg in season means you're eating sustainably. And as mentioned before, the UK environment is perfect to produce these items. 
you know, when you look at some of the imports that we have, that could be argued to be more on the vegetarian vegan agenda. You look at almond, for example, in California, it takes 158 litres of tap water to produce one litre of milk. That's in California, where we've been hearing for decades now about a severe drought, and that water has been taken out of what is needed for the human population to grow almonds, which are being exported to the UK for, for almond milk. Now, people would say dairy cows use a hell of a lot more, but that's simply not the case because dairy farmers get the majority of their water from the grass, and we're not having that water because obviously it's locked up in the ground. I think that's a very important point to use. Yes, they use a lot of water, but that water is predominantly coming from the rainfall that goes straight into the grass and not into the human supply chain. You look at avocados and deforestation, 17,000 acres of deforestation on average each year in Mexico. That's how much they chop down each year to grow avocados. So I think when you talk about sustainable, whether it's meat or plant-based, you make sure that we are eating in season and buying as much UK produce as possible. So if there's one takeaway lesson, I think, from what I'm saying is, Go online, print up the calendar like you can see in front of you and buy as much in season as possible, because, you know, I think that's really important. I think we need to be doing as much as possible on that front. I'm going to very briefly touch on health because the final part of the UN definition states that for true food sustainability, it must not be detrimental to our health. Now, to achieve a balanced, healthy diet, you need to eat a variety of different foods. The Eat Well guide here, which you can see in front of you on the screen, is a useful guideline to help you select the right proportions of foods. As you can see, there are separate sections for fruit and veg, starchy carbohydrates, dairies and proteins such as meat, fish and beans. You know, the NHS recommends that we have a portion of red meat daily in our diets. It's just the healthiest way to ascertain all the proteins we need. Obviously, we need vet fruit, veg, carbohydrates and meats. And there's a few infographics there that truly show kind of um, the iron, the B vitamins, the calcium, the zinc that we need in our diet. And that is best to come from red meats and white meats, and as well as other food groups. So there's also a link there. So anybody watching back can click on that link and it will take you to an Eat Balanced Up video. And you can really see the benefits you can get from eating meat and make sure you are eating balanced. The last thing I'm gonna to touch on is standards, because I think that's very important when speaking about food sustainability. It's important to know that the food you're eating is being produced to the best possible standards and in a sustainable way. We should be proud that British standards are world leading. And when we purchase British food, you are purchasing a product that has been produced sustainably. In terms of plant health, the UK has the most advanced biosecurity measures it's ever had. Our National Action Plan on Sustainable Use of Pesticides is recognised as world leading in raising standards and reducing the risk to consumers and the environment. 97% of UK produced food meets or exceeds trading standards. Just a lot better than being imported food. The environment, I think I've already ticked off, so I'll leave that. Animal health and welfare, which was touched on previously. The UK offers some of the best farm animal welfare standards in the world, with a robust and comprehensive legal framework and well-developed industry bodies that recognise the importance of animal health and welfare. We also have credible quality assurance schemes and voluntary codes of practice. I put some logos up there, so anyone that is really doing their food shop, look out for the Lion logo, look out for the Red Tractor logo, look out for the RSPCA Short. These are world leading standards which they don't have elsewhere in the world, which really showcases what farmers are doing within the UK to make sure your food is sustainable and that they are being treated right. And, you know, while the food that we are eating is being produced to a quality way. <laughs> Indeed, in terms of animal protection, the UK, um, in terms of the Animal Protection Index, ranks in the UK as, num as one of only four nations to receive the highest grade. Now, all this comes at a commercial disadvantage um, to compare to other countries who don't appear to, who don't adhere to these standards. So, you really do focus on buying British for your for your for your food sustainability. And then, finally, in terms of antibiotics and hormones, the UK is the fifth lowest user of on-farm antibiotics across 31 European nations. Um, you might say, why are we fifth? That's because the top four are Scandinavian nations, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and, and Finland, obviously. And essentially, that's because they live in dry, arid, cold climates where diseases don't spread as much. So to be fifth is a vital achievement. Indeed, in the UK, 30% of total antibiotic use on farm is what we average compared to a global average of 70%, which I think is a massive win of UK farms and we need to showcase. And as well, the use of hormones for growth promotion in farm animals is banned in the UK. Hormones, hormone use is common in some parts of the world, along with low dose antibiotics to increase growth rates in animals. And say so anyone watching back can just look at this as an example. This is basically the difference between New Zealand, for example, and the UK. As you can see, growth hormones banned in the UK, legal, um, banned in New Zealand, legal in the UK. Weed killer, banned in the UK, 
League of New Zealand. There's a lot there that just shows how good our standards are compared to worldwide. So to conclude, food sustainability with COVID, it's a natural resource that we need to take advantage of that's not detrimental to our environment or our health. And I think I've showcased exactly what UK farmers are doing about that and why we need to back British farming. UK farmers are working towards being net zero by 2040. We're boosting biodiversity. We're using our natural resource of our wet, warm, maritime climate, which is vital to grow the product that we need. I recommend you all go and eat seasonally, buy the fruit and veg, which is available at the moment, and don't import it from around the world. I recommend you all eat balanced and eat healthy and realise that UK farming is world leading. I put my email there for any questions. So anyone that wants to follow up, feel free to send me an email and I'll take any questions and get back to you ASAP. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And and, and thanks again, Ava and, and Luke. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you each just a, a couple of point, points of clarification, really. Um, First of all, um, Ava Luke, um, you, you started your presentation talking about some of the um, sort of environmental implications of, uh, of eating plant based diets uh, and so on. Are, do, are you able to sort of um, do, do you have any information about um, the comparative um, impacts of different kinds of food on, on climate change and, and carbon emissions? Is that something that 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 the yeah you're you're able to share with us at all. Or or if it's something you want to come back to us about in the future, that's fine too. Sorry, you mean uh just the comparing <laughs> animal agriculture with plant agriculture the Yeah, whether well, does that whether whether you you have any information that, that you use about that I was very interested in George's slide which sort of showed um carbon emissions from um different types of um agricultural products from with fr from within the UK's um carbon emissions. I just wondered whether you you have any contrasting or similar information. Um I don't have one to hand just a that specific data, but I would strongly encourage the the some of the books and podcasts that we had previously. Yeah. Also, to look in our references list. All of those articles, peer-reviewed, sort of scientific, like journal articles about all of this information. Like, if if you're interested in information, just properly read some of those articles. Thank yeah. you. That, that that's that's helpful. Thanks for that. Um, George, um, you, you talked about, um, I think, I've, I've, I made a note, you said um, there's the, across Warwickshire there's 160,000 hectares of, of um, farmed land um, and it sounded like about half of that is um, cereals and grains and so on and the other half is, is, is like dairy and livestock. Um, do we know how much of that is um, consumed locally um, and how much of it is exported and do we also know about the where, where it's processed and how much of that is processed locally as well is there any information on that um, I would be able to find out that things like that I mean we've got places like Farmers Fresh in Kennewa for example who are an abattoir so they take um, obviously a significant amount of lamb in the area um, we have got processors um, near Stratford who take a lot of all seed away from cam grain um, so there are, you know, Wiltshire is very much an agriculturally, you know, focused area. So obviously when it comes to the economy, um, it is absolutely vital to um, support in that sector. But um, I can get you as many examples as you want. I don't have them to hand, but um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about a hell of a lot of it is our book because obviously to produce crops, it takes up a lot of land. But that goes back to what I said about obviously a lot of the land in the UK isn't suitable. You know, you go to the uplands in Wales or go to the uplands in Derbyshire, the Lake District, you can't put a combine and and take wheat out of that. Only that can be used to really kind of all that land is, is storing carbon. Um, so really the only thing you can farm on that is um is your sheep and you know essentially that is important. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and my my other question for you, George, was about um, you talked about farming standards and environmental practices um, uh, amongst farmers, and you know you clearly provided some um, a lot of information about the the kind of standards that are achieved on on British farms. Do you find there is <laughs> significantly different practices and are there any particularly good practices that, that you would 
sort of highlight that perhaps are great examples for the rest of the farming community to follow? Yeah, I'd say over the last, since 2014, um, UK farmers have massively dropped antibiotic use. Obviously, we realise kind of ant antibiotic resistance is a major issue for potential future human health. UK farmers have, like I said in my presentation, massively dropped antibiotic use. Um, you know, we've got things like Red Tractor, who go out and inspect farmers um, across the county and across the UK. Um, you know, these are world leading standards and farmers, they want to adhere to these standards. It's really something that farmers want to do. The main issue comes from the fact that, you know, Moving into, you know, politics here, you know, if we're importing produce um, from around the world, we can't be kind of offsetting the gains that British farmers are making by importing products which don't adhere to our standards. And I think, you know, all kind of Warwickshire and British farmers are happy to have world leading standards, but it needs to be backed up by the British public to a uh, to a uh, to buy to kind of see what we're doing and supporting us by making sure they are buying British to support us. Um, so no, there's a hell of a lot of work being done by British farmers and say that antibiotic resistance is one of the leading things that is being done. Thank you. I should have said right at the beginning, um, I should have introduced Graham Foe Skinner, who um, is uh, works with me at Warwick District Council and um, has been so sort of heavily involved in putting this webinar together. Uh, Graham, I mean, is there any points of clarity that you wanted to sort of get um, asked while um, we've got Ava and Luke and George with us? No. No, I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's 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 uh, the concept of the same meeting having both um, Ava and Luke and then George. It's really interesting. It's it's, but no, I mean you were both both presentations really clear. So no, I haven't I haven't got any any clarification questions. Just a, a word of thank you for all three of you. Thanks, Graham. I think I, I broke up then for a moment, so I didn't quite hear what you said, but um, uh, everybody else nodded appreciatively, so I'm sure it was wise words. Um, <laughs> uh, well, in, in that case, I mean, I just, just, just to um, pull everything together, really, it, it, it has been really fascinating hearing the real um, the two different perspectives on um, sustainable and healthy eating and uh, really, really fascinating um, points of view, lots and lots of facts for us to, uh, to to think about. And I'm also really grateful to all of you for um, you know, pointing in the pointing us in the direction of where we can get more information. So some of the um, you know websites and uh, uh, podcasts and books and so on that, that we can refer to. Um, it is it is a, a really tricky area for uh, those of us who aren't experts in it to, to find our way through. Um, but I think you know, there are some sort of key messages that um, you know you 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 you've, you've you've all put across, and those are around just being really thoughtful about what what we eat, really thinking about um, where that food comes from, how it's produced, really trying to understand more about what um, the impacts of that production are. Um, you know, I think the point about the, the, the seasonality is also um, a, a relevant point as well that, that George, you, you raised in particular, but I'm, I am sure Ava and Luke would, would sort of concur with that sort of um, that, 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 that point. So whilst it is complex, I think there are some sort of key themes that have come out of what you've said that we should all keep in our minds and whatever our views on um, eating plant-based diets or um, eating um, you know, meat based diets or or whatever might sit in between those options. Um, you know, it's some of those principles apply in, in all cases. So I found it really fascinating. I'm really, really grateful to you, the, the three of you for for giving up your time. And I hope that, um, you know, lots of people do have a look at um, this webinar and uh, get as much out of it as I have. So so thank you to you all. <laughs>